Hi guys, welcome to my channel. So today we're actually going to speak about something that I get a lot of questions around. So it's about the journey to psychology, what a psychologist does, and basically everything related to psychology. Um, and as stated in the previous video, all information that's shared on this channel is for psychoeducational purposes. And I hope that this answers the questions that I've been getting. So the first thing that I need to explain is what psychology is. So psychology is about the study of the mind and human behavior. So everything that we do in the different registrations of psychology will be related to that. So there are different kinds of registrations. So you can be a registered counselor, you can be an industrial psychologist, a clinical psychologist, an educational psychologist, a psychometrist, there's quite a lot of registrations and all those registrations will be centered around that, even though it's, in, it's working in different settings, but it has more or less the same kind of thing, including neuropsychology as well. So I'm just gonna go through a list of questions that I've been getting and we can try to answer them the best way that I can. So how do you become a psychologist? Um, so I've been getting a lot of questions about which subjects should I take at school um, and those kind of stuff. So with psychology, it's not like medicine where you have to take pure maths um, and you have to take physical science. So there are certain subjects that can be an advantage to you, but there's not a list of, of prescribed subjects you need to take to practice psychology. So things like life sciences would be something that's an advantage, but it's not a requirement that's compulsory for you to have. So in terms of subjects, honestly, there's quite a lot of flexibility. Um, but with that being said, maybe try to pick things that are related to um, like things like life sciences. That's something that's about studying people um, and studying what happens in terms of the life cycles, not only in plants and animals, but in humans as well. So those kind of stuff might be things that are helpful for you, but not necessarily something that's required in the field um, of psychology and studying towards a psychology degree. Um, the only thing that you need to be aware of are the mock allocations that you need to get. So um, I know that there's certain unit points that you need to achieve in order for you to qualify to register um, for that specific qualification or get accepted rather into university. So do yourself a favor, actually go to the different universities. If there's a specific university you wanna to go to, go look at the point scores that you need to get. Go check if you need to write an NBT. So for example, for UCT, you need an NBT. Um, and for other universities, you might necessarily not need that. So actually getting the information of what the requirements are for you to get accepted into undergrad is something that's very important. And also some universities offer an undergrad that's also included, um, that also includes an honors degree. Others, it's just a three year degree and then you need to do an honors as well. So those are the kind of things that you need to be aware of um, and look into while you're still in matric. Um, and even before that, actually, uh, so actually look into that. If it's something you're interested in, start doing research in those areas. And then once you've got into um, undergrad, the other question I get in terms of like work experience and things like that, I mean, that's something that you need in masters in order for you to get into masters and we'll get into that. But it will be helpful for you to actually get involved in things that are related to psychology during your undergrad. So things like getting into the psychology um, community group that's part of your university um, and looking into organizations you can start working with to gain that kind of experience that you'll eventually need for masters. And then after that, you obviously need to get into your honors. So you might already be in a qualification that has an honors degree, um, which may bypass that. But after undergrad, you need to apply for honors. And the same thing applies. You need to get a certain level um, of marks in order for you to get in. So for example, they might say um, a minimum requirement is a 70% overall aggregate in your undergrad. So that's something that you actually need to look into and look into the specific universities that you want to go into. And guys, don't narrow your minds and say, no, I just wanna to go to this university. Try and apply to as many places as possible um, because that will increase your chances of actually getting in for that. So um, once you've done your honors, 
you can have two choices now. You can either decide, okay, so I actually want to go do something in psychometry. I know UJ was the one university that actually offered a program where you can uh, do like a training for psychometry. I think it was six months, if I'm not mistaken. So you need to look into that and then decide, okay, so is this a path that I want to follow? Because without a master's degree, you can't really practice as a psychologist in all the registrations. So that's counseling, clinical, neuropsych, um, clinical psych, educational psych. Um, so you need to actually think about what are your options after honors because there's very limited options. And then another option is actually registering as a registered counselor. Um, so that's also another registration you can consider and actually look if it's still available for you to register as. So as a registered counselor, you'd have to find out from your university which places offer internship sites to actually do that because the university is the one that's actually going to assist you in finding those places um, and getting placed into those areas where you can eventually register as a registered counselor. So again, speak to your lecturers, speak to your supervisors, speak to people within the field um, within your university to get more information with regards to the options that you do have. And then there's masters. Um, in order for you to get into masters, you need to go through quite a rigorous process. So you need to apply first of all. And then once you've applied, you need to get invited to an interview. So it's not that just because you've applied, you guaranteed an interview spot. So already in your application, you need to consider having a strong application in terms of the autobiography that you write, um, the information that you provide for yourself. Basically, you're selling yourself through that application so that you can get an invite to come in to actually do the interview. And once you've applied, again, apply to as many universities as possible so that you get invited to as many interviews as you possibly can get into. And even there, they want to know quite a lot of information. Different universities have different structures. Um, I was in master's interviews a very long time ago, um, but the information that I've gotten for people from people that have actually been through the process more recently, it's consistently the same kind of information. And I, I made a video a couple of years ago in relation to that. So that might be something that's helpful for you to watch. And also find out from other people as well that have went through the process, what kind of questions they ask, what they can expect. And also guys, I cannot stress this enough, but apply for the thing that you want to do. Because personally for me, people kept telling me, no, you're not going to get in for clinical psychology. So rather apply for like counseling and things like that. And to be honest, there is no such thing that it's easier for you to get in for counseling psychology and then clinical psychology. Because at the end of the day, it's more about fit. Do you fit the university and the people that they're selecting for that year? Do you fit that specific profession? Um, and for some people, they may have the advantage of being quite flexible enough to be perceived as fitting into both. And others, you're more suitable for another. So assess yourself, understand the different registrations and what they do and also apply for the thing that you're passionate about. Do your research, find out what the scope of practice for a counseling psychologist is, find out what the scope of practice for the clinical psychologist is, and continue on with all the other registration. Each one of the registrations within psychology or the career, sorry, the careers within psychology um, have equally the same weight personally for me. Um, and you can make equally as much of a difference. Don't go for the one that everyone says, yeah, this is the cool thing to do. Know what you know, know what you want, know what fits you um, and follow exactly that. And then once you've done your masters, um, you then need to go into your internship. So with the internship, um, again, you need to apply as there's lots of applying to be a clinical psychologist or any psychologist for that matter. So you need to apply um, and for some universities, they still have the system of actually placing you um, into an internship site if you've been part of the university. Um, but for most of the universities, as far as I know, you actually need to apply um, for an internship site. Again, you go through interviews um, and I think with everything that's been going on and people moving on to like the digital um, aspect of doing things, it's a lot more easier because you get to do um, your interviews via like Zoom and other media platforms 
rather than having to travel to the different provinces and the different internship sites, which was something that was quite a tedious process, both for masters and internship. So once you've um, qualified for coming into an internship, which is basically finishing your masters. So in masters, you do both your clinical work and your research. So to get into an internship, you don't have to finish your research, but the masters component has to be something that you've finished and you've qualified in for you to go into internship. I mean, once you're in internship, um, yeah, yeah, that's quite a, an interesting experience as well. Um, I think that's, probably one of the most difficult experiences that you'll have within the profession because you basically do everything like every single thing that you do for that qualification for that scope of practice that's something that you're going to be exposed to um so yeah it's quite a, a an interesting um and challenging experience but it's definitely worth it so after internship initially you could go to community service without finishing your research. But now the new system says that you need to finish your research, write your board exams, and then go into ComServe. So um, ComServe is quite an interesting experience on its own, um, and board exams. So I wrote my board exams while I was still doing my internship. So you do have the option of putting it off until you're done with your internship. You have 24 months before um, you have 24 months after you finish your internship for you to actually start um, your ComServe. So yeah, you can have that option of taking that gap um, or you can actually go into it immediately. Um, yeah, I think it's 24 months. Please do confirm as well. Uh, but you can choose to write your board exam afterwards, like after your internship. For me personally, I wanted to start working at the beginning of the year uh, which is 2021. So I wrote my board exams in October last year. So there are three dates you can write. You can either write in Feb, in June, or you can write in October. But like there are three rotations in which you can write in. Um, so personally for me, I found that to be quite challenging because when I was writing my board exams, there was quite a lot that I needed to do for the internship. And also it's close to the end of the year because you're trying to finish everything off and make sure you have all the necessary documents for you to be signed off. So it was quite a stressful process. Um, so a lot of people opt to not write during their internship and actually write once they're done. So once you're done, you again have to apply um, to be part of EcomServe. And there's actually a system in which you apply in um, and you, you choose five options or five placements um, in which you can do your ComServe. And then uh, the Department of Health will place you in preferably one of those places. But I was someone that wasn't placed in any of the places that I applied for. Um, and they could literally place you anywhere in South Africa. Um, so, and then once you get placed for that, then you start your ComServe. Um, and after ComServe, only then do you become a qualified psychologist. So for other um, registrations, I know for educational psychology, you don't need to do ComServe. So after your internship and you're done with your research, you're actually qualified and you can start practicing. But specifically for clinical psychology, you do need to do your ComServe. Um, so again, please do check with HPCSA, call them, find out. Um, what do I need to do to qualify? Do I need to do A, B, and C? Um, and get that information from them because they are the professional board for which we register under. So they will be able to give you better information and better um, understanding of what you do in that profession, but also what you need to have in order for you to qualify and practice. Um, and then the other question that I got was about opportunities at correctional services um, for cons like um, for clinical psychologists or psychology as a profession. So for me, I'm there as a conserv, um, and I think maybe I can make a separate video where I actually speak about my experience there. Um, but it's the same opportunities as as every other profession. Um, or every other setting in which you practice as a psychologist, you do the same kind of work that you would be doing. Um, and that's another question I got. What else do we do aside from therapy? So based on the HPCSA, my scope of practice is to assess, formulate, diagnose, and treat. 
So what that then means, means that number one, in terms of assessments, there are different kinds of assessments we can do. We can do clinical interviews with the patient. Um, we can do psychometric assessments, whatever assessment that's necessary for me to understand what is the problem. Once I've understood the problem, I then formulate it. So, okay, so why does this person present with this thing at this specific stage based on this history they've got it? Because they could have presented at any point. What's making them present now with the problem? So then I then formulate that and you use theories to try and get an understanding of what is this thing? How can I um, better understand this presenting problem? How can I try to predict? Because that's what a formulation helps you do. It helps you predict like the course of um, the presenting problem. And then you can start thinking about ways of intervening and the challenges you might experience. So that's another component of it, actually intervening and doing something about it. So you can either see the person yourself and have therapy if that's what's necessary. Think about other treatment options. Do I need to refer to someone else that can give this and this and that? So for example, do I need to refer to an occupational therapist? Do I need to refer to um, like a neuropsychologist? Do I need to refer to a psychiatrist? So who do I need to refer to? So in a nutshell, that's what we do. Um, so we don't just do therapy. We do therapy with individuals, groups, families, couples, pretty much a lot of people, um, children as well. So it depends what you're more drawn to, um, the kind of field that you want to work in, but you get exposed to most of those things, if not all of those things during your internship. We also do psychometric assessments. Um, we do neuropsychological assessments. Um, neuropsychology is actually a new registration now, so that might change, but for now, we're still able to do, as clinical psychologists, we're still able to do neuropsychological assessments. Um, we also do, sure, like we do quite a lot, guys. Please just check the scope of practice. Um, and it's part of the things that you get trained in. But specifically in the settings, um, in the setting that I'm in now, I also do things like risk assessments. So risk assessments are assessing whether um, the offender, if they've been considered for parole, how much of a risk do they pose to society? Um, and even in a general kind of setting, those are kind of things that you do do. So you will do a risk assessment in terms of risk to self, risk to others, risk from others. So it's not just limited to um, the correctional facility that I'm part of. Another question that I got uh, is where a psychologist can work. Um, so there are different kinds of settings that you can work at pretty much every setting, as long as they're humans and we're trying to study their behavior, you can definitely fit in there. Um, so, and also you need to consider your scope of practice. So for example, an industrial psychologist will work in a corporate kind of setting um, and they will work quite closely with HR and do performance appraisals and those kind of stuff. An educational psychologist will work within the school setting. Um, they'll work quite closely with children within the schooling age, doing things like school readiness assessments. There's also counseling psychologists. You can work like at a student um, university counseling center, um, those kind of things. So you find us pretty much everywhere. You can also be employed by a company to be a clinical psychologist or counseling psychologist for that specific company and the employees. So there are different kinds of, you can work in a correctional facility, like I'm working now. You can work in a psychiatric hospital, you can work in a general hospital, you can work in a private clinic, you can work, you can work pretty much everywhere, guys. Like it's not just limited to, you work in a psychiatric hospital if you're a clinical psychologist. There are lots and lots of opportunities. And again, it depends on what are you drawn to? What do you want to do? Where do you fit in terms of the profession? And where can you use your skills um, the best way in order for you to, to make an impact? And what draws you in and what you're interested in? Um, and then another question is about money. <sighs> Uh, this is an interesting question. So people keep asking, like, is there money in psychology? Um, and guys, I don't go around asking people their salaries, but um, it depends, just like everything else, what you mean by money. Me saying, yeah, there's quite a lot of money is different from you and your perspective of it. 
Um, and it also depends on the kind of registration that you are registered under. So to answer the long and short of it, yes, there is money within the profession. Um, and also it depends on what you do, where you do it, how you do it. So you actually start getting paid from your internship, um, which is quite nice because at that point, you're pretty much an adult and you're trying to make sure that um, after like, at least six years of depending on your family for finances or depending on like scholarships and things like that you have a sense of, of um being independent and as it, and having an income that's coming your way so yeah you can definitely make a good living out of it um i know specifically for clinical psychologists i don't know if it makes much of a difference if i estimate it in this way but we earn more or less um the same as uh, intern doctors. There's really not much of a difference in terms of our salaries. So honestly, I was able to live comfortably um, with my internship salary. And there's not much of a difference between the internship and comp salary, um, but afterwards you do earn quite um, a bit more. Uh, so I hope that answers the question that you had about money. Um, but yeah, there is money. You it's just like any other career um it depends what money means for you um it means different things for all of us but for me personally i'm quite happy um with the income that i'm getting and then the last thing uh actually the last two things that guys i feel like some of the questions that i get um are interesting questions um I feel like it's quite important for you to know exactly what psychology is about because some people have quite a romanticized idea of what the profession is so do your research get an understanding of what it is before you actually commit yourself to it and also before you ask questions actually do research that information that you asked me for is information that's available there i'm more than happy to help substitute um and and help add on to information that you already have but um i find that quite a lot of people will ask questions and literally when you type into google that same question you will get more responses and a more informative response than i can provide so please do that and if you get stuck anywhere like i'm more than happy to help you also not just google hpcsa website university website get information from your lectures, from your supervisors, call HPCSA, like they are there for you. They are there for you to get information. So you can call and find out, um, call universities and find out. They will be more than willing to provide you with that information. There is no shortcut to things. And if there's anything psychology has taught me is there's definitely no shortcut um, into getting to that place where you are professional. And then the last thing was a day in my life um, and what a day looks like for me. Uh, I think it's quite different for depending on the kind of setting that you work in. Um, so for me, and maybe I can make a video of this, but it's not going to show much. But uh, I start work at seven o'clock in the morning. And because I work in a correctional facility and during that time, um, the offenders are still quite busy with like breakfast and things like that. So in the morning we have like a, a tea um, setting that we have with my colleagues. So we actually get there um, and just engage with in each other and interact because I feel like that's the one time we get to interact with each other. Um, and you can also do your admin. And then from like half past eight, that's when um, the offenders start coming in. So you have your individual sessions until like um like around one o'clock because around two o'clock they're already back into their cells so i work from seven to three so after that i do like my session notes um i do research um i i look into other information that i want to know about the offender and things like that so that's pretty much what my day looks like um i think it's quite difficult to record or make a video of what it looks like because we're not allowed to bring cell phones um, for various reasons and also like making a recording of the facility as much as it would be nice for you guys to see and it's amazing but there are brilliant people out there that would want to use the information for other reasons so yeah um, i hope this video gives you better clarity um, on the profession um, 
information around um, questions that you might have had uh, but yeah guys two things that I have just do your research and know what you want and literally um, that's the best you can do but thank you for tuning into my video and I will catch you guys next time bye